All right, Braves fans, this is State of the Braves, and I'm George McNair. And, man, uh, the season is uh, just about over, and it is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, you know, the baseball season is long. My, my wife would say it's too long. I, I would disagree with that. But uh, it is a long season, right? 162 games, and we have played 159 of them. And uh, we have one series to go against the Washington Nationals. And, you know, a week ago, uh, some things were, were pretty negative, even on the, uh, you know, the back end of the Braves uh, clinching the National League East. You had a week of pretty bad baseball as they kind of relaxed and, uh, you know, some things happened that weren't, weren't particularly pleasant. We've had two uh, injuries, finger injuries with Freed and Morton. And yet this past week, all has seemed to turn around and go right, just at least in terms of the play on the field and uh, the Braves of course now have clinched the best record for home field advantage across all of the playoffs not just the National League and so this is great news uh, they have certainly earned it this year they now sit at 103 wins 59 losses and uh, they will wait basically to see who they will play in the National League division series uh, is this the bre the best Braves team in the modern era? Uh, yeah, maybe so. It might be the best Braves team in the history of the franchise. I mean, good grief. <laughs> You're talking about going back to the 1800s. But even if you just stopped at, you know, since 1991, and, you know, I would say that's the, the great modern era of Braves baseball. Yeah, it might be the best Braves team in that uh, that whole time period. We're at 103 wins with three games to go. And so, you know, I looked back, the best Braves teams in terms of pure record were the 1998 Braves with 106 wins and the 1993 Braves with 104 wins. So certainly this, uh, this year's team, they can't eclipse 106 wins of 1998. They could match it. Uh, but even even if they don't, you know, it's it's so close. I, I think each of these teams, it's it's easy to compare them. So I thought that we could compare these three teams briefly uh, before we get into some of the other things I want to talk about today. So, you know, one thing that stands out with the 98 team and the 93 team is, of course, neither of these teams went on to win the World Series. Uh, two of the more disappointing exits in Braves postseason history. We've had quite a few of those, haven't we, over the years? Um, but yeah, 1993, I would say that team, very similar to uh, 2022 team last year in that sudden exit from the playoffs and basically two teams that just had to grind and grind and grind all the way to the last day of the regular season to win the division. And I know Tom Glavin has talked about this several times on the broadcast, but 1993, they were basically just totally drained. Remember, they had to go all the way to the last day of the season to defeat the San Francisco Giants. They won 104 games that year. The Giants won 103. Uh, the Giants missing the postseason, amazingly. That was basically uh, the the season that um, that spurred baseball to add the wild card um, wild card round. And uh, so anyways, the Braves, yeah, they won the division that year. That was the last year they were in the old National League West. Uh, but as Glavin said, they were wiped going into that series, that NLCS against the Philadelphia Phillies. And man, when you look back at that series, what a disappointing series and just a heartbreaking series. Three of the four losses, the Braves lose that uh, that series in six games, but three of the four losses were one-run losses. Game one was a walk-off loss uh, to the Phillies in the ninth inning in Philadelphia. Game four was a 2-1 pitcher's duel that they were on uh, the wrong side of. And game five was an extra inning loss that basically flipped the series. And, uh, you know, so you just have that team going into that series already drained. Of course, you also have a team that had gone to the World Series two years in a row. And, uh, you know, you talk about the strain that that puts on a pitching staff and all those things. Um, but nonetheless, right, they, they played great all the way up to that series to win the National League West, and they lose that series. Um, so, look, the Braves are um, – 
are not in that position this year. I mean, that's one positive thing you can say, even though they didn't play great on after um, after clinching the division. They've seemed to ramp things back up now and, and certainly seem to be much more focused. And, uh, you know, all of their position players are playing every day, it, it seems like now. And uh, so that's a good thing. I think they are better rested and probably in a better headspace going into uh, the postseason than they were in 2022. And, you know, you see that that mentality and that difficulty of the 1993 team as well, just being totally mentally and physically wiped going into the playoffs. I don't think the Braves are in that situation. So that's really good. And I think the Braves have probably learned from 2022 and they seem to be uh, tackling these kind of awkward off days after uh, the season ends a little differently. I don't know. You guys have seen the news that the Braves are going to be playing several simulated games during their off days. And they're actually opening up Truist Park to fans to watch these games. And I think that's really cool. I think it's a great way to, um, you know, it's another way to reach out to fans and make them a part of this thing, but also to keep some level of um, a focus for the players going into these obviously very important games. So, you know, that was the story of 93 and of uh, 2022. Um, and hopefully it's not the story this year as the Braves clinch much earlier. Now, the 1998 team, uh, I think, is kind of a flipped version of this current team. So 1998, of course, uh, Morgan Wallen wrote, wrote a whole song about it just like it's one of his failed relationships. But 1998 was so disappointing, so close, such a great team, 106 wins and a historically great pitching staff. If you guys don't remember 98, okay, this is the pitching staff of Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, Denny Nagel, and Kevin Millwood, uh, Millwood being kind of the young rookie, and he had a great season in his own right. So you have five deep pitching staff and a very good offense, not as epic as – um, the 2023 Braves offense, but a very good offense. And what happened in that series, the bats went totally silent in all four losses to the Padres. In the middle of the order went totally cold, and the bottom of the order wasn't, um, you know, really heavy hitters like the Braves have uh, this year. But the middle of the order, totally cold, and especially their big hitters, Galarraga, Andres Galarraga hit 095 during that series. Chipper Jones just hit 208 and Ryan Klusko 083. So middle of the order doesn't do much in that series. The bottom of the order isn't strong enough to, to kind of carry the freight uh, when they are needed. And, uh, you know, the bats just to go totally silent. It's really hard to imagine that happening to the Braves in this postseason. You know, it's just such a deep one through nine lineup. And I think that's one of the benefits they have over um, the 1998 team. Now you don't have the the dominant pitching staff, right? And you have a lot of question marks right now with the with the Braves pitching staff. Uh, but of course, uh, one thing that Braves fans learned is having a five deep pitching staff is awesome to get you to the postseason. It's going to mean a lot of regular season wins, and yet a five man pitching staff doesn't help you that much in a seven game series, right? You, you kind of are leaning on your top three guys. Uh, maybe you have that four starter pitch a game, um, but you need uh, three really strong starters for those seven game series. Hopefully the Braves will get that back when Charlie Morton, we hope will come back um, for the NLCS if the Braves can get there. But, you look at 98, very different team, a tremendous team, but a team that leaned heavily on pitching. And I think the Braves now are kind of the opposite. We have a historically great offense with a good pitching staff. Yes, we have question marks in that pitching staff, but if the pitching can hold up enough, uh, I think the Braves are set up for uh, better, better fortune than the 1998 team. Hopefully we won't have to write uh, a country song about the 2023 team. So, you know, we're, we are on the verge of the postseason, and we have some possible NLDS opponents we can talk about. I'm not going to talk about them very uh, in-depth. That's probably on the next episode after the season concludes, and maybe even waiting until we have a, um, 
uh, an understanding of who the opponent will be. But the four most likely opponents for the Braves would be the Phillies, Cubs, Marlins, and Diamondbacks at this point. The Phillies um, are pretty much locked in at the four seed. So you have the Cubs, Marlins, and Diamondbacks fighting it out to, number one, make the playoffs. But one of those teams not only will make the playoffs, but will be the five seed. I think right now the Diamondbacks are the five seed, but it could really shift because there, there's only about one game separating these three teams. Um, you know, if I had to rank who I would prefer the Braves to play, of course, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, but I would love to see the Braves play the Cubs. We saw them dominate the Cubs most recently, of course, sweeping them. Um, and we'll get into that series here in a minute. But I think the Cubs, uh, the Braves match up very good with the Cubs. The Marlins would be my number two option. Uh, of course, the Braves did not play them very well in Miami, but at full strength, going full full at it, I think the Braves uh, would take it to them. And of course, historically, over the last several seasons, the Braves have dominated the Marlins. Uh, number three would be the Diamondbacks. They scare me a little bit more. They're young, they're athletic, they're pretty dynamic, and they have uh, two or three really good pitchers at the top end of that pitching staff that could shut you down. Um, of course, Zach Gallon being the top guy there. And then, of course, the Phillies um, would be my number four. And the Phillies, honestly, they proved it last year uh, with their performance in the postseason. I think more than anything, it's not so much the talent of the Phillies, though they're certainly a talented team, but it's the mentality they bring. They're not scared of the Braves. Um, and, you know, they proved it last year. So uh, they have Bryce Harper in the middle of that order. They have some guys who can really do a lot of damage in terms of power in the middle of that order. And uh, they have some some pitchers who, on a good day, can shut you out. So the Phillies, I would prefer not to see. Now, would I love to see the Braves just take it to the Phillies and you know sweep them out of the playoffs? Yes, that would be very satisfying. So look, the the tr the fact of the matter is the Braves would be a um, a betting favorite against any of these teams. Uh, but yeah, the Cubs or Marlins, I think I would walk into that series feeling much better. You know, people are talking about the Phillies and, oh, it's it's likely going to be the Phillies. But golly, golly, guys, I mean, you know that the the playoffs just don't always go how you expect them to go. And, and last year was proof of that. And so just because the Phillies are the four seed and are going to have probably home field advantage for that first uh, three game round, a uh, wild card round, does not mean they will survive through that. You could have a very surprise opponent playing the Braves in the NLDS. So we'll just have to wait and see on that one. All right. So guys, maybe I've taken too long to bring this up, but we have to talk about Ronald Acuna's historic achievements. Uh, now he is the only member of the 4070 club. You know, he hit his 40th home run against the Nationals in Washington just a few days ago. And then a few days later, he gets steal number 70. And it's not just that he's done this, but again, Ronald does it in style. Uh, his home run number 40 uh, in Washington was hit at 116 miles an hour, just a line drive shot into the left field bleachers. And then steal number 70 against the Cubs was in extra innings after he, um, after, of course, he ties the game in the 10th inning, he then steals second and sets up the game-winning base hit by Ozzie Albies to bring him in. So, you know, Ronald is just a transcendent talent. Uh, I think Brian Snicker has basically said the only person who's going to break Ronald's records right now is probably Ronald Acuna Jr. himself. And, uh, yeah, I mean, all you have to say is no one has ever done it in the history of of baseball, this kind of power and speed combination. It is very, very special and just an awesome moment. Uh, hopefully you guys were watching, watching it. He got a standing ovation. You know, the game, the game pauses there in the 10th inning. Ronald takes the base out of the ground and then just takes it home with him. <laughs> and, uh, and actually you might've seen this on social media, the, the Cubs, broadcasters uh, did not like this moment. They were really critical of how the Braves kind of paused the game and they were getting triggered by this whole thing. And you just look, I mean, I understand it in, in a sense. The Cubs, um, 
they just blew that game. They they basically blew all three games, and they are feeling it right now because they are on the verge of missing out on the playoffs. So I think they're bringing a lot of that energy and um, and those negative emotions to the moment. But they did not care for Ronald taking the time and the Braves taking the time to honor Ronald Acuna. But, hey, it is the first time in the history of baseball anyone's ever accomplished this, and I think he deserves every moment that he got that night. And I also just think it's awesome to see him being so appreciated by the fans and just having that moment on the base paths to take it in and and just realize what he has done, what he's accomplished, just a super special moment for him. You know, also, another thing that Ronald could accomplish this year, he is just four runs away from 150 runs scored. And I mentioned this to you guys, uh, I think last time, that he would be just the fourth player in modern baseball history to get to 150 runs scored to join Jeff Bagwell, Ted Williams, and Joe DiMaggio. So those are pretty pretty cool names uh, to join a club for, and he could do it this year. Four runs scored in the last three games. It is certainly possible he's going to do that. It's also been very not- noticeable how the attitude across baseball has seemed to shift that Ronald is basically going to win the MVP over Mookie Betts. And, you know, it all started to shift when the Braves went to Los Angeles. Ronald had a tremendous series. He hits home runs in all three of those games. And Mookie has dealt with an injury. Uh, His performance has not been bad, but it hasn't been remarkable compared to Ronald. And it definitely seems like Ronald is is going to win the MVP at this point. And sorry, Bill Plaschke. I don't I don't know if you you guys have have seen Plaschke. He um, wrote an article. He's an LA Times columnist. He wrote an article article a couple weeks ago, basically stating that Mookie Betts should absolutely be the National League MVP. And ever since then, Ronald Acuna has just dominated baseball and done all of these special things and had all of these amazing accomplishments. And sorry, Bill, but I think Ronald is going to win this one. You know, the other guy we have to just keep talking about, guys, is Matt Olson. And Matt Olson now, uh, he, guys, he's having an all-time great Braves season, and we just need to um, recognize it, right, and talk about it, talk about it more. And and sometimes. You know, it's not Ronald Acuna's fault, but Ronald's having such an amazing season. Maybe Matt uh, is losing out on, you know, just being talked about uh, a little bit. But we definitely should appreciate what he's doing. So just a few days after setting the Braves home run record, um, passing Andrew Jones uh, and his 51 home runs. Olsen now has 54, by the way. Uh, Olsen set the Braves all-time RBI record the other night and is now sitting at 136 total RBIs for the season. And he passed Eddie Matthews in that one. So he passes two Braves legends, two Braves who have their numbers retired. Uh, He does it in the same season. And that is just a remarkable feat. Of course, he is leading baseball in two of the three triple crown categories. And yeah, so this is one of the greatest offensive seasons in Braves history. And I started thinking, where does it stack up among Braves' all-time great seasons uh, offensively, right? And so I started going, diving down into uh, just, uh, you know, baseball reference page and OPS. So I I just kind of, and that's just one, of course, one offensive category you can focus on. But OPS, of course, is on-base percentage plus slugging percentage. And just one metric that we could look at for great offensive seasons. And it's not the greatest offensive season of all time, but I still wanted to go through and look at these and, and also just remember how great uh, we've had, uh, you know, so many great Braves players over the years. So Hank Aaron's greatest, and I think I've actually shared this one with you guys before, but Hank Aaron's greatest offensive season of all time, his, um, His OPS in 1971 was 1,079, which is the highest that I've found of any Brave in history. There might be something out there that I missed, but that was, that's up there. Um, Eddie Matthews, again, so Olsen just broke his RBI record, but he had some tremendous years really early in his career, especially, and of course, Eddie Matthews, also a Hall of Famer. Uh, In 1953, he had 1,033 
season. Rico Cardi, you know, he just joined the Braves Hall of Fame. Rico Cardi had a lot of injuries throughout his career and also was known as not a great def defensive player, but he put it together in 1970. He had 1,037 OPS. Uh, Dale Murphy's greatest um, offensive year was actually not one of the years that he won the MVP. You know, he won it twice. Dale Murphy had uh, in 1987 a 997 OPS. Uh, by the way, I started diving down into who won the MVP that year because Dale Murphy with that year was, um, he only got eighth in, in the MVP vote. So I, I dove into that. Andre Dawson won the MVP that year and uh, he he definitely should not have. If you, if you look at the who voted for MVP and I mean, I don't know who voted for him, but but who got voted in? I mean, it is crazy if you look at it. So um, Tony Gwynn uh, should probably should have won that MVP. He hit 370 that season and was good for like almost a 10 war and didn't win. Dale Murphy probably should have finished third. He's finished eight, eighth. And so anyways, if you dive into the 1987 MVP uh, race in, oh, by the way, um, Ozzie Smith was second in MVP votes that year, and he had zero home runs. And not a, I mean, it was a pretty good offensive year for Ozzie Smith, but I guess he just must have been that great defensively to get that many votes. But it's just a very strange uh, vote if you dive into it a little bit. Anyways, back to the overall um, OPS Braves history conversation. Uh, Chipper Jones. Um, had a, a tremendous year, of course, in 1999. He won the MVP, and he definitely deserved that one. I think they got that MVP vote right. He had a 1,074 OPS in 1999. Andrew Jones, the year that he hit 51 home runs, had a 922 OPS. That was his best mark in his career. Fred McGriff in 94, the, sh uh, the strike shortened the year, had a 1,012 OPS. Um, he had one other season over 1,000 with the Braves. Andres Galarraga, who only played two full seasons with the Braves, but he had one of his great seasons in 1998. He hit 991 uh, OPS in that year. Gary Sheffield um, had an amazing um, season in 2003 with the Braves, and he had 1,023 OPS. Freddie Freeman, his best year offensively, and I'm excluding the 2020 shortened season in 2020 uh, sorry in 2017 he had a 989 OPS and then of course Ronald Acuña and Matt Olson this year so Acuña currently has a 1009 OPS and Matt Olson is at a 992 so Olson has kind of hovered around a thousand for most of the second half of the season Acuña is just over a thousand so Olson again he has the most home runs and most RBIs of any Brave in history. His OPS is not as high as some of these guys. And I think that's just because he's sitting around a 280 um, batting average this season. He's a pure home run hitter, right? And uh, so while you maybe wouldn't say that this is the greatest offensive year in Braves history, uh, I think it's safe to say this may be the best pure power season in Braves history. And uh, it is just an incredible season for Matt Olson. Uh, he'll probably finish third or fourth in, in the MVP vote, and he absolutely deserves that. Um, all right, so guys, the Braves are on the verge of a team home run record. That's another thing on the horizon and something worth talking about. You know, the record is 307 that was set by the Minnesota Twins in 2019, and the Braves currently sit at 304 home runs with three games remaining. Uh, it certainly seems like they're going to break this record. Uh, and I just wanted to compare 2023 to 2019 to put this in perspective, right? 2019 is known as the juice ball year. And uh, certainly the, the numbers back that up. So the total home runs hit throughout all of baseball that year was 6,776 home runs. Uh, the Twins, like I said, finished first that year with 307. And the Yankees finished second at 306, right? There were multiple teams that were really, really high that season in home runs. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that the ball was juiced that year. Now, this season, 
uh, the total home runs hit almost a thousand fewer home runs have been hit this year than compared to 2019. So 5,768 home runs have been hit across baseball and the Braves sitting here at 304. The next best team is the Dodgers at 245. That is remarkable, right? It just puts it more in perspective how dominant this team has been from a power perspective. Um, and guys, it, it's just when you look at the Braves lineup and the their starting lineup and how many home runs each player's hit, it really is jaw jaw dropping. Um, the other thing that I think is incredibly impressive is that the Braves. Uh, are very likely to set the all-time team home run disparity mark, uh, beating the 1927 New York Yankees, which, of course, everybody will say is probably the greatest team in baseball history with, with Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth, of course, having two of the greatest offensive seasons of all time uh, together in the middle of that lineup. Uh, and, of course, uh, home runs weren't hit as much across baseball in 1927, and the Yankees hit a ton of home runs. But that is uh, just an unbelievable mark that the Braves are likely to set. And the Braves also have five of the top 11 home run hitters in the National League. Uh, Ozzy Albies is tied for 11th, but, it, you know, you have Marcelo Zuna, Austin Riley, and, of course, Acuna and Olsen near the top of the league, Olsen right at the top of the league in home runs. So this is just a prolific power hitting team. And the question is, will this power and will this dominance that the Braves have had all throughout the regular season, will it show up in the playoffs? Uh, I think it will. I mean, evidence is that the Braves have, have performed not only against weaker pitchers, but against, you know, the number ones and number twos in against each team's number ones and number twos. And I think they're going to continue to do it. I see no reason why they won't. And I really like the mentality this team plays with. They're loose. They are confident. And they are led by the greatest player in baseball in Ronald Acuna. So, guys, most recently the Braves have swept the Cubs, and I was really encouraged by this series. You know, they've kind of gone back and forth and not played the greatest in September. Um, but, of course, that's all with the perspective that they've tried to get their roster correct. They've, they've thrown a lot of guys out of the bullpen and out of their starting lineup that's, that are not going to show up in the postseason. Uh, but in this series, it definitely seems like they are refocusing and getting ready for the playoffs and it was a playoff like atmosphere the cubs are fighting for their playoff lives and the braves beat them in three straight games they did have to come back in game one and they got a little help from um <laughs> from suzuki the outfielder um for the cubs in right field in that first game but hey the braves won it cubs definitely looked a little nervous out there and uh, did not play super well and, uh, and the Braves won this series outright. Uh, but, you know, the Braves did this without any of their top pitchers going. You had Elder, Vines, and smith Shaver starting these games. But you had the full lineup going in all three of these games. And you have better results from the bullpen. And this is one of the biggest things that I think happened against the Cubs. The bullpen seemed to stabilize. And it has been a bad bullpen over basically all of September. But they were pretty darn good in this series. And then you also have that offense. It just keeps coming guys. And the Cubs have a pretty good, uh, especially starting staff. And yet the Braves took it to them in every one of these games. The other real positive sign that happened in this series is Kyle Wright in game three comes out of the bullpen. And I think he's showing signs of improvement. He's not quite the Kyle Wright of last year, uh, but he looks pretty good. He's spotting his pitches way better. You're seeing maybe a slight uptick uh, in his velocity. He's more 94, 95 right now. And he's, uh, he's spotting that curveball much better, which is exactly what he has to do to be effective. Uh, and, you know, he's probably going to come out of the bullpen, it looks like, in the postseason. But I think that can be an effective strategy for the Braves. Now, uh, a negative from this series uh, is Bryce Elder continues to struggle. And I do want to tackle that question of do we trust Bryce Elder and who is going to pitch game three 
uh, in this NLDS? Well, the answer to the first question, do we trust Bryce Elder, or at least do I trust Bryce Elder, is actually no. I mean, it's really the easy answer. No, I, I've come to not trust Bryce Elder because he has not been very good throughout the entirety of the second half of the season. Uh, his last 15 starts, guys, that is not a small sample size. The last 15 starts for Bryce Elder, he has a 549 ERA and a 146 whip. A lot of hits, a lot of walks, and um, just a lot of damage is being done off of Bryce Elder. Uh, in September, after actually he started September with two good starts, but he's had three really bad ones um, in his last three. So last three starts, 12 and a third innings pitch, 13 earned runs, 19 hits, and nine walks. And man, that is just ugly. And it's coming at a really bad time, right, as we're approaching the postseason. And it's all command and confidence. And I don't think he has much of either right now. It's like when he's in the zone, the ball is up and he's getting hit hard. And when he's out of the zone, these are non-competitive pitches and the guys aren't chasing. And, um, you know, when he's at his best, he's dotting uh, the, the edges of the strike zone and he's causing guys to ground out into double plays, getting him out of any jams that he might get into. And right now he's not getting out of those jams because he's not – uh, he's up in the zone, and he's not getting ground balls. It's a lot of doubles. It's a lot of home runs. It's a lot of damage. Um, you know, the the good thing is, if Bryce Elder does end up starting game three, in the playoffs, you can have a much quicker hook, right? So in with Elder, it's always pretty obvious if he has his stuff going well or not. You know, so if you need to get him out after one or two innings, uh, you can do that. It's obviously not the best scenario, but uh, you can keep yourself in the game. And with this offense, you can bounce back if you get a bad start from Elder. Um, Elder to start game three and Wright being ready in the bullpen seems like the most likely scenario to me. That just seems like how the Braves are setting this up. I think there's other scenarios if the Braves decide Elder is pitching so badly that he doesn't deserve a game three start. I think that could also happen. Um, but the other thing with Kyle Wright is the Braves might need him in game one or game two. I mean, let's be realistic. Strider occasionally, he has these blow-up innings and doesn't go very deep. So if that were to happen, maybe you need to lean on Wright early. Um, Max Freed with his blister. What if the Braves are trying to limit innings? What if he only goes four or five innings and you have Wright coming um, you know, to the aid of Max Freed. So I think he could be used in any number of scenarios throughout uh, the NLDS, and I think that's why the Braves have decided to go with, um, with Kyle Wright out of the bullpen. So I, I do think you obviously have game one and game two will be pitched by Strider and Freed. I think game three, like I said, it's most likely going to be Elder. But, you know, what about A.J. smith Shaver? What about even an Alan Winans or a Darius Vines? Um, I think any of those three guys, well, not I think, all three of those guys have pitched better than Bryce Elder as of late. And you could piggyback Kyle Wright with any of those three guys instead if you wanted to, right? A.J. smith Shaver, uh, he, he made a start just the other night. Three and two thirds innings, one earned run, no hits, one walk, two Ks. And this is the game in which Kyle Wright came in and piggybacked off of him. And uh, Smith Shaver looked really good in, in that start, right? He was touching 99 miles an hour with his fastball. He obviously is not pitching deep into games right now. But again, with him and Kyle Wright, this could be a good situation. Um, Darius Vines. His most recent start, six innings pitch, two earned runs, four hits, two walks, and five strikeouts. Super solid start. Um, Alan Winans, uh, you know, maybe a little shakier, but five innings pitch, two earned runs, seven hits, and six strikeouts against the Nationals. And he's going to go one more time against the Nationals here before the end of the year. So, you know, if I had to bet, I, I'm willing to bet that the Braves are going to go with Bryce Elder in game three. And, um, and see what happens. But it might not be set in stone. And depending on the situation, I could see A.J. smith Shaver showing up in a big way 
uh, in this NLDS as well. So just let's, you know, it's going to be one of the more interesting things going into this first round to see what the Braves do. And look, they're in it to win it. And I, I do think that while they want to honor Bryce Elder and the contributions he's made this season, you got to go with the guy that is pitching well and gives you the best chance to win. So I certainly have my doubts about Bryce Elder being that guy right now, but we'll obviously just have to wait and see what happens. Um, another very brief thing I wanted to mention, you know, I do want to criticize Brian Snicker in just a very small way. And I love Snit. And of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of props goes to Brian Snicker in so many ways. Uh, but I do not like lately how he's been moving Michael Harris all over the lineup. I don't really understand it. You know, a few times it was because you were giving guys days off. You had this double header in Washington and not everybody played in both games. So, of course, you're going to change the lineup around some there. Uh, but in the last few games, the lineup has basically been whole, right? You've basically had all of your regulars playing, and yet you still have Harris hitting sixth one game, and last game he hit eighth, and you had Arcia hitting ninth. And for most of the season, especially the second half of the season, when everything's been going so well offensively, Harris has hit ninth. He said many times he enjoys hitting ninth and kind of wrapping the, the lineup back around to Ronald Acuna. Of course, Harris gets much better pitches when he has Acuna protecting him. Um, so I, I would just like to see Michael Harris back in that nine hole. And maybe that's how they will play it in the playoffs, but I just really don't know why they're messing with the lineup and messing with Michael Harris at this point. To me, keep the lineup the way it functions best. I think a, a, base, a baseball lineup is very much like a, an organism, right? It's kind of complex, and sometimes guys just happen to hit in – in spots better than others, and, and it can kind of work the best when you fit it all together in the right way. Like, I really like Ozuna and Rosario hitting back-to-back. -back. For some reason, it just seems like they work really well off of each other and off of each other's energy. RC hitting eighth and Harris hitting ninth. I like that, and I like wrapping Harris around to Ronald Acuna and their dynamic play on the base paths together. It just makes sense. Uh, so I hope that's what Snicker does. Um, I, I think probably him messing with the lineup is partly due to Murphy and Darno have not been hitting very well from the catching position. Arcia has, you know, he's definitely gotten a little colder with the bat as of late. But to me, I still just think it's better to let let the catchers hit seventh, let Arcia hit eighth, and we'll come back to to Harris in the nine hole. I will say that I hope that these few days off that are coming up between the end of the regular season and the NLDS will help Sean Murphy. You know, offensively, he has just been a shell of himself in the second half. He was so unbel unbelievably good in the first half. You're just like, how have the Braves gotten the steal of the century trading for this guy? And he's still an unbelievable player, right, especially defensively, but you know, he has that within within him to be a great offensive player. And I wonder if there's some nagging injury that we don't know about. I mean, it's certainly likely with him being a catcher and all the punishment he's taken over the full season. So maybe we get a better Murphy after these four or five days off than we would otherwise. Um, so, you know, that's my hope. And uh it would be great and maybe even a little surprising, you know, sometimes in the playoffs, the guys who aren't, haven't been playing great in the regular season suddenly are the heroes in the postseason. And that would be pretty cool if Sean Murphy or Travis Darno were able to do that. All right, guys. Well, the Braves and Nationals are going to end the season playing a three-game set. For the Braves, they've got Winans. Uh, Spencer Strider, and then a bullpen game to end the season. And, uh, of course, it's going to be pretty interesting to see if Strider can finish the season strong. If he gets the win, he will have, uh, at that point, gotten 20 wins for the season. He'd be the only 20-game winner in baseball. Uh, I think he's probably pitched himself out of the Cy Young discussion, unfortunately, but still a great season. And, of course, the main thing is him being ready and full go 
for the postseason. A couple other things I'm looking for is the bullpen to finish the season strong and especially figuring out who is pitching really, really well going into the playoffs out of the bullpen. I also want to see if Ronald Acuna can break Otis Nixon's steals record. So that number is 72. So he's just two away from tying it, three away from overtaking Otis Nixon for that steals record. And then the last thing is, will the Braves break the all-time team home run record at 307? And I, I expect they will do that. And maybe they'll blow past it by a few. That would be really cool. So, guys, it has been such a great season, such a fun season to be a Braves fan. And, yeah, I mean, we're entering the real season, right, the postseason, and uh, hoping for some really special things to happen it's very exciting as we are getting into that stage of the year. But let's take a moment and just appreciate what the Braves have done and how fortunate we are, really, to be Braves fans. Guys, we're not Mets fans. We're not, we're not even Phillies fans. We get to be Braves fans, and that is a special, awesome thing. So we will continue to cheer on this team and uh, hope for good things, guys. But I really appreciate you uh sticking with me and sticking with state of the braves uh continuing to support me and so please uh like this video if, you know if you're watching on youtube share this uh episode with friends and uh guys i will talk to you very soon